incredibly difficult tool to write. It's one of those things you say yes to eight months ago. Uh, yeah, that'll be fine. I can co cover this. And then the weeks come up, and you know, oh God, I'm on first. No, no, I don't really want to go on first. You don't. All the talks never go on first. I'm not sure whether to talk about BIM. The conference is about BIM. But all of the rest of the talks after me are heavily BIM focused. So I weave BIM in. And I was sat down with a glass of wine last night. I think, okay, I'm in front of my peers, my boss. Uh, do I give an honest talk? <laughs> or do I give uh, everything's fine, world leading, university talk? Luckily, he's coming on his iPad, so I will give him an honest talk. And therefore, that allows me to look at where we are now, what's worked. I'm going to try and look in the next three years' time. Can't look to five, five's flying cars, that sort of stuff. Next three years' time, things are changing incredibly quickly. This goes on for about 35 minutes or so, so it leaves time for a chat about the things that I raised. I think we're on the edge of a fundamental shift in the way we understand place and place and space. How we operate in places, how architecture works, how cities work. We're on the edge of automated cars. Five years away, three to five years, there will be automated cars. The whole system is built, built around the car currently. How does this change the way we plan, architecture works, place and space works? We like to form groups. The Bartlett is a system of groups. CASA, which I lead, I'm not saying that we've got it right, but we're an open plan lab. I'm a planner by trade. And, but we're a mix of mathematicians, computer scientists, psychologists, <coughs> architecture, planners, all in one open plan space. So the silos aren't there. We're not architecture, we're not planning. People who I meet often don't know what the hell I do because we're not silo based. But we're looking how places work. We're looking at flows, we're looking at space, we're looking at real time themes. We're looking at how we use architecture. We don't just put architecture up and walk away, is what culture means. We're looking at what, how people feel in places tracking people, social networks. And there's new knowledge platforms coming up, new knowledge platforms that we use. All of our work has for years gone on to YouTube. Everything we do. It's a different way to communicate and outreach. And arguably this is about communicating and outreaching the work. And therefore there are challenges there and don't have all the answers, but I know what we've done. Not all of it's worked. The various key words <coughs> we're using grants currently, big, smart. I don't like any of the terms. But the quote is, 90% of all the information which we currently have our fingertips on has been created in the last two years. It's an IBM quote. I'll be honest with you, I don't know whether it's true. But it's this sort of information which shows how the world has fundamentally changed. So information is everywhere, from sensors, mobile devices, the mayor's office is putting all this information online. The mobile phone is currently key to all of this. But I move on in a few slides' time to say, five years' time, the mobile phone will be dead. And we need to be putting people into the marketplace now who knows what is come, coming next and how to work with the new systems which are coming online. A lot of it isn't joined up, but arguably location is at the centre of all of this now. Everything is becoming geolocated. And we need to teach people how to use these feeds. We need to teach people how to code. Everyone from the built environment system, I think, should do a coding course. 
They need to know how to write apps. They need to know how to analyze. They need to know everything I can't do. Okay, this is where I feel old. But I wrote the course. I wrote the course that if I was 10, 20 years young, younger, I'd have done. Because I trained as a planner. I did the planning optional GIS course. I was the only one on it. Planners don't like this sort of sort, so they're, they're not kidding. But if you can teach a planner to code, perhaps there's something in there. Because they can use the software, they can write their own software. And their heart is in the right place. They want to change the world, how the world works. I think we could compare, compare the smart place to 1994, hypertext. The web was young, things were really joined <coughs> up, but there was something there. There was something that you knew this could change the world. The urban world is beginning to put out feeds, traffic flow, social network tweets, lamp posts <coughs> being wired up. As a lab, we use the urban scene as a living lab we send people out. But we don't always send them out. We sit in the lab and we mine. We mine place and space. And we're moving towards live feeds. So if we view it as a hypertext world, there are these live feeds out there, air pollution views beginning to pop up, real-time temperature feeds, traffic flows, pedestrian counts, the shops becoming wired. We're going inside places. It's not all about outside. And this feeds in to build GIS, the Internet of Things. There's not much out here. But this is our live London view. We've gathered all of the live feeds we can grab from air pollution to mood to background radiation count, river level the tubes, the weather, the news. And we've mapped it too, so everything has a geolocation. But arguably, the mapping section of this actually doesn't work. There's a system here, maybe we're moving beyond the map too. Not quite sure here. London has the most feeds, so we've done this for the UK, but this is what makes us unique from a Bartlett point of view, because we have access to one of the cities in the world, which is beginning to put these feeds out there. It is one of the most accessible feeds that we can grab. And this goes into our software, but we've got to know how. We've got to know how to use it and how to grab these feeds. From a policy maker point of view, we put this into the mayor's personal room. He likes to tap, to touch things. So, <laughs> so we've made an iPad wall. We've put all of these feeds on a 3x4 iPad wall. And it allows the mayor and his policy makers to see how London is currently working. And it's powered by a phone. So the iPhone powers the iPad wall. And it shows his live feeds that every 10 minutes or so we Hip in a blatant plug for our own lab, and they all join up. The CASA words come up, and then it goes back to the slightly drier live feeds. But it's interesting that the research and the teaching is going into policy within about four weeks. We view our teaching because we run a course now, we run it at MRES, as teaching in the wild. So what I've learned, and we've got some of our key people here, so my apologies because I haven't told you this. What I've learned, you know, two weeks before, I then teach, and we throw it out there that I don't know what's going to come next. It's up to you to try and prove you can research, you can use these themes and everything that we've taught them, so we teach them to code, we teach them about software, we teach them about a little bit of BIM, a lot of GIS. And then we put the question into their hands. What would you do with this? 
we know what we could do, but we haven't got time. We're in meetings, da, 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 da. you have time. Go and run with it. And we archive things now. This is arguably big. So we, we're archiving London in real time. The hard disk space grows, that's fine, we can move everything to the cloud. But it means the science bit is can we predict what the next half hour of London will be like? What if the Northern Line goes down, the Eastern Road shuts at the same time? We can put systems in place via this, these joined up information systems to predict the next 30 minutes. And I think this is where the interesting science <coughs> begins to kick in. Classic example is when you hire bikes. We know when you tap in and when you tap out. When you dock that bike, our system logs that in real time. And it archives it. So you can do time lapses to see how London rides its bikes. It goes to the outer ring, then vans pick them up and they move in. So it's beginning to become sort of real-time analytics system. Just confirming the point that we know where things are. And we are going to know where you are too. Which is tricky. Prism picked up over the last week and it makes me twitchy from the research point of view. How many of you here tweet? Hey, loads. Normally, one hand goes up. It depends whether you've got location turned on and off. But even if it's not, we can grab everything that you tweet and we know where you are with a timestamp and either a rough location or we know you're in this quad. And that changes things too from a research point of view and a teaching point of view because we're giving our, our people on our course access to where people are in real time. Ethics kicks in massively. I gave a talk in Oxford on this and halfway through my talk someone got up and began shouting at me. This is never a good sign. <laughs> and with PRISM, it makes it even more twitchy. But we're looking towards a real-time census. The census costs a fortune. We don't need that. We can mine you. We can mine everything you do. Whatever you put online, if you don't want it shared, don't put it online. Because everything can be grabbed. So are we walking blindly into a 24-7 surveillance society? Yes. But we get cut on this. We get things back and share. We, we like to share. We like to be part of things. One of my PhDs is putting a big data toolkit online. Because people like me, who haven't done my own course yet, but I might actually do it next year, need to know how to use all of these fields. So simple systems for social scientists, built environments haven't learned to code, who can collect this data and then do what they do well to change the places we live, to change how things work. One of the first systems we put out was the Twitter meter. New York, London, Paris, Munich. If anyone remembers the Pop Group M, 1979, <coughs> this was their tagline. It came across as a teaching in the wild view just a lunchtime chat. What if we knew what people would talk about on Twitter? There was no news items around this there. But it, it rates what's online. This is a weekend of London tweets. All of our movies have slightly dodgy soundtracks. The power of YouTube. Every time you tweet from your phone, it's grabbed. But this is fantastic from a research point of view. Because we finally know how place and space works. Okay, only people who are currently tweeting. But even that replaces everything that we used to know, everything that we used to do. 
I'm going to move this forward to Heathrow. You may have your phone turned off. By the way, what? These tweets come on. <laughs> And this is where the ethics kick in, and you have to take away the names. But we get this use names as a researcher, you have to ethically clean them all out. This flies into someone's house, next to someone's shed, where they tweet something like, Happy birthday, how are you, kiss? Do they know that we've grabbed this? Of course they don't. But it's so rich from a research point of view because it feeds into every other bit of information we have. Geodemographics, crime, design, movement. We actually know who lives in these places now. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And of course we can map it. We can map the hidden network. So these are new maps, these are new systems that we can use to, um, to understand how place and space works. We renamed it a bit. So the mountain. Uh, it was named, we named it purposely this way, to get the work picked up by the press. Get the work picked up by the press, it helps research grants, people when you're up, communicating the research more. So putting the research online, the research is seen, people can make joint courses. The science is the same just slightly, the way you communicate the work. You can pick up transport links, Heathrow Peak terminals, and it gets in the press, the press like this sort of stuff. But it interests me, because it is allowing us to see a hidden world, and it's a hidden world which is not replacing anything that we currently do. We're not throwing away all of our years of training. It adds to it, it adds to what, what we do. And people like to be part of it. This is a lesson here. Second part of the talk moves on to innovation. Open street map. Probably one of the most fantastic crowdsource systems out there. The founder of OpenStreetMap used to sit next to me while I was doing my PhD. And we used to whistle on about how the Ordnance Survey were behind the times and the large companies were finding it hard to catch up. We had to sign data agreements, and it was all painful, and lawyers would get involved, cease and desist if we put their maps online. <coughs> and he had that spark, and it's that spark that we try to teach and communicate. And he went off, and he mapped the entire world with help of a few friends. But if you said to yourself, this was, this is 2008, I'm going to go away and map the world, there's no way you'd have got a research grant for that. It would be too hard work. Eight pages, justification of impact, just too hard work. But with a few friends at first on bikes and GPS units, then later with linked with large firms, They've gone away and they mapped the world. The last I heard of him, he had just got new married. He tweeted that he was in his open top sports car driving across San Francisco and was about to go windsurfing with his wife and he's just raised £5 million pound to float the firm. There's a lesson there to him somewhere that small research labs like us can put people out into the world, and they can change the way entire systems work. We're just a two-man team at first. It's not the big companies nowadays. It's the small companies. It's the shortage. It's the people who have to do our course. This is where I see it now. I could well be wrong. It's a complicated line. BIM, geographical information systems, I back to cross all of these worlds. I go to GIS tools, give one of those. People in GIS look across at BIM, don't quite like that. BIM look across at GIS, they're not really doing it right. The Internet of Things is coming along. Probably the next big thing. 
Does that feed into GIS? Does it feed into BIM? Not yet. Level 3 BIM? Perhaps. The urban modelling world. Urban modelling looks at all of this. I think because they've probably got it wrong. There's a need to join things up because everyone is doing their own thing and I'm caught between the whole world of this. It's too complicated. You shouldn't have to do a master's course to know how to make a map or to use BIM. It's just, that's just madness. That's not a direct quote. The internet thinks this is the next big thing. In five years' time, everything will have an IP. All of your chairs will be smart. They will know your satellite. They will communicate to the live UCL view that you are sat in this room, you are sat on these chairs. Every brick will be tagged. BIM will carry on throughout the lifetime of the architecture, which is what it should do. I don't understand why we just walk away. We build things, get it all done, everything's wired up, then we hand it over and we walk away. We're moving towards real-time building information. And this is what excites me. This is where the fundamental shift is. You can buy Internet of Things now. You can weigh yourself, and this tweets your weight. Why would anyone want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Who here owns one? <coughs> this is me. This is the Christmas peak. <laughs> <laughs> I own one because I have to live the dream. So you're beginning to buy things which are communicating to the outside world. And they become part of the architecture. So the home, it's not a word I actually want to weave in, the home is becoming smart. But not via the, the classic smart fridge stuff but actually useful systems which communicate information. I'm just going to quickly show you this clip, if the sound works. We've been involved with Oxfam, and we've wired clothing up with Oxfam. It's called the Internet of Second Hand Goods. Really interested in new things. In, interested in things which are already in place. This is a jumper. It talks. Okay, so um, I've donated this pink stripy jumper because um, I had it last year and I wore it to a barbecue and um, I met a boy at the barbecue and um, he was my boyfriend for a few months but we're not together anymore so I thought I'd donate it. It's as simple as that. Our things, <coughs> we've put systems in place to make any object in the world we're not allowed to communicate to the web. Everything has its own IP, it's powered by your phone, it's very simple technology, but it grabs location every time something is read. And it can feed in a bit, it can feed in to GIS systems. But the worlds aren't quite lined up yet. It's a question of having faith to run with this stuff too. <coughs> with Oxfam. We carried on. Hi, Alan, yes. And I'm donating this rather interesting, fabulous, unique dress, which I actually wore to a rather splendid occasion, which happened to be Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday party at Hyde Park in London. So if you buy this and wear it, that's what you can tell your friends. So that dress sold for £165. It was worth £25. Things are worth more. The Internet of Things. I worked in the shop for a week, self dispatch. And I was in there and I was selling clothing, which turns out is quite fun. I could do this by thinking, what am I doing here? I'm a planner. Why am I in Selfridges selling dresses? But if you just have faith on past midway, it does join up. There is a <coughs> method in the madness here. This is part of the architecture. It's part of the architecture and the place and space that we don't see currently, because it's just part of everyday life. So we made their app, the research labs are beginning to make apps now, because you want to reach the outside world, you have to have a computer scientist in-house, a computer scientist who also understands place and space. Very difficult to find, unless you train them yourself. 
and they called it shelf life. Lots of things online. And I was having a glass of wine last night, and I didn't know whether to take these slides out. They did go. But I think this bear is possibly a glimpse of the future. This good luck bear here that I bought. I would never buy this thing in my life. It's a bit tatty. But this bear came with a story. It was part of the place, it was part of the space, it was part of the shop. It's tagged. It was a lucky bear. It gave someone good luck in good luck in their GCSEs. I think it cost about ten pounds if we were two. But it's tagged. So the thought to take here is that everything is being tagged, not just us, but every brick, every component, every nut, every bolt of the place and the space is beginning to communicate themes. We've taken this one step further at UCL's first pop-up shop, which opened two weeks ago. It's only open for a month. It's viewed as a living lab, which means we don't quite know what we're up to. But we can tweak things, we can go in, and we've made the architecture talk. So the architecture asks you in the shop why you haven't bought things. Not why you have bought things, why haven't you bought things? What's wrong with the mug or the poster or the clothing that's in there? So making architecture communicate and the data theme is part of the building process now. We get these live themes. Wired called it chat detection. I don't like the phrase. But they called it the top 24 or 25 technologies in 2011. I'm not sure. Talking architecture, I'm just going to be floating out there. But it's interesting from a teaching point of view, because how do we communicate this stuff? How do we train people to go and make talking architecture? Is it important? We've tagged 4,000 bus stops in Norway. Every one of them tweets using our technology. A bus stop last month left a message behind that someone had lost their mittens. Because you can point your phone at it, record a movie, and the architecture of the bus stop is becoming a social space. The places we don't see in life. The bus stop tweeted that someone had lost their gloves. The person followed the bus stop tweet and they kicked their gloves up. And I, then I don't know whether my work is done, I can retire, we can make bus stop tweet, or whether there is something about joining things up to the web, because this is the missing thing. I think we're finding the missing link. And there's new forms of information, information that we don't currently ask, which is becoming big. We're streaming this big data all of the time. It's emotion. We build things. We communicate places. We don't really know whether we like them or not. Office spaces. How do I feel at work? What if I could communicate how I feel at work in real time to my boss? Am I happy? Am I stressed? Am I overworked? Obviously, I'm happy. Happiness is a classic example, built by a guy called George, who worked in our lab for a year. It got onto the Apple front page, millions of users, and it asks you throughout your working day how happy you are. Simple as. But it can take a sample of the sound, grabs the location, and it can take a photograph, and it will analyse colours. Turns out we're happier near blue. We're happy in there to see, we're happy in there to things. It's new information. The big data is a bit of a mismatch, but there are nuggets in there. And we're training people to get those nuggets and go and run with them. So it tweets you, it asks you how happy you are. I was working with a colleague who won't be named, but his wife got hold of his happiness feed. It turns out he was happier at work with his secretary than he was <laughs> at home with his wife. 
But there's something about these feeds. So we're streaming all this information out. But it's information that we're asked. So to take the complete shift now into the research, uh, blue skies type stuff, got a PhD in house who's got brainwave headsets, and we bought head headsets. Used to be high end hospital type stuff, come down in price. And we're walking people around 1970s shopping centres to see how much they actually do drag you down. So how we feel about architecture, how we communicate our emotions of place. <coughs> Is emotions in BIM? Is emotion in GIS? No. But it could be on an iPad wall in the mayor's office. It is on an iPad wall because we, we measure happiness and we feed that to the mayor. The mayor knows how happy London is. <coughs> Next year, of course, of which, of which there are places, we will be exploring a new grant which is communicating the empathy of location and empathy of situations that we're going through now. Uh, we pitched to the EPSRC to build the bomb camp machine out of Blade Runner. And we, we won the funds. And how does empathy link with all of this world? It's challenging. And I throw this out there because, as I've said two or three times, I'm a planner. I so what I do. But if we can communicate empathy of place and empathy of situations, we're working with women's cancer groups to take people through probably the hardest time of their life and communicate empathy via digital means to the people who are in that same situation. It's a shift. It's not linked to BIM, it's not linked to JS. But it's a link to streaming data online and new techniques. And this allows us to actually view things in a different way. There are two types of marker, augmented reality. First one is phone base. This is Layer. Layer is a platform where everybody can create their own fantastic augmented reality experiences. Augmented reality is a new mass media. It's where the real world is combined with digital world. We're going to bring these digital experiences into reality. And you're going to engage into reality with this new medium. History, art, ATM, finding real estate for sale, how things looked uh, 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. Foursquare, Twitter, tourism, sports, commerce, gaming, social. Gaming and augmented reality is a completely new job. Interacting with objects right in front of you. And you got crazy shit on there. It's you moving around, experiencing it. This is layer. Right, slight reality check now. Beyond all of the hype. This is a marketing movie. I've done this, okay? I've been out around Hampstead Heath, it was. Got my phone out, said, hey, look, this is augmented reality, this is the future. Pointing it around. The person I was with, there weren't happy smiles, there weren't laughter. It wasn't an <laughs> arm around my shoulder. She looked at me and said, Andy, you're a sad little man. <laughs> 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 I'm doing this with research, aren't I? Right, no. So, reality check, this doesn't work. The phone, no, doesn't work. But there's something in augmented reality that ties this together. You can have marker based augmented reality. This is more like planning for real stuff. During my PhD, I did planning for real working with uh, user groups. And it just horrified me that people still use cardboard Weetabix packets and post-it notes <laughs> to communicate the future of where people are going to live. You know, there's, there's new techniques out there. So you can build options in. It's very easy to do this, this work. 
and you can slide them <coughs> in and out. But there's something like this that doesn't quite work. The markers are a bit clunky. You don't want to put markers all around the world. You don't want QR codes all around the world either. There needs to be a better way around this. So our MRES course, we use teaching in the wild techniques. We teach them how to code, we teach them about place and space, you know, mapping, a little bit of it. Autodesk for a while to make fantastic. They give away all their software for free to us now. That shifted how things work too. So we have access to the most important software suites out there and they can run with this. So we gave them the thought of they have an end of year thing and we just pointed to the UCL map and they have to make a living to see. It's tricky. This is what they built. Data back to the back end system. Huh. 
and sharing all these bits. Do suddenly do there's data on. wall. Oh, oh, it is. Sure. Yeah. 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 Even just use the term grants. Hey, it just doesn't pick you up. It will be. Cool. Thanks, man. See you, dude. Whoa, cool. Take a photo of this. That's why it's all voice by Share my circles. Touch works. No, perhaps voice. I'm late. Means you're too late. Music, stop. That's all shared. Hi, what's up? Hey. Hey. You want to say something cool? Yeah, sure. Is that a Yep. Okay, here goes. It's <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> I view this a bit like Match.com. <laughs> we have a girl on the platform waiting for train. They have augmented reality up on the roof with a San Francisco view. But this is coming, and we need to pre prepare the students that we're taking in now for this world. They need to know how to cope with this stuff, how to put this data out, how to make sense of it. So I think location kicks in, and that's the thing that ties it all up. That's what links it. BIM level 3 comes in. I think the terms GIS, BIM, Internet of Things, will eventually fade. I think it alienates people, some of these terms. It's simply about location, place, and space, and new techniques to understand architecture and construction. Possibly. The London Data Store, in my last five minutes, has put lots of information out there. 70 mobile applications have been made. They're all about the things that we do. We should be making them. Because we know about place and space. And people are making money in this world. It is arguably the new gold mine. There's a rush in them hills of data mining. And we could put people out there who actually knows what it all means. So I think there's a need for enterprise in this space. Don't necessarily have to write research grants nowadays. Don't, what do you mean you can't be PI because you're not a doctor or you're not employed full time? Rubbish. Go to kick, Kickstarter. Raise the money yourself. There's a need to, I think there's a need to simplify things. BIM is too complicated, GIS is too complicated. Google Glass simplifies it down. But all the information is the same. Just the way it's processed, communicated and used. And we want to put students out which change the world. They're inspired by our work. We look for the smile in term two. Term one is all trans, because it's quite complicated. But term two, suddenly something clicks and they smile. That means that we've done our job. I think that's how we change the way we teach. It's central to everything that we do. I think we need to be ahead of the curve. Because I'm a reader, pondering professor at some point. And where do I go if I need new information? If I want to make that link between, I'm using the new Autodesk Suite, 3D Max, 2014 came out, couldn't get something to work. And I can go to my book, I go to YouTube. YouTube teaches me stuff. That's why I blog. But everything I do online for free, tutorials, YouTube clips, book clips, to give back to this knowledge base which has helped me learn things. I'm a plant. I wasn't taught any of this. And I wish I was. So I think there is a need to join this up. There's a rapid response we need to, to meet this world. A, we need to have a view of how we use technology and how we teach it, not to remain in the silos with which we're currently in. And I may, may not be right. Thank you for, thank you for your time.